Trails Collective, Ian here with the weekly rundown for August 5th, 2020. On these rundowns, it's my hope to keep you abreast of what's shaking in our regional trail community, rundown of events that maybe happened, FKTs, registrations that are opening, new product, and also, uh, importantly, uh, really voices from out in the collective. Uh, those who are throwing down some adventures, who want to weigh in on the state of things, uh, and really anything. So you got a clip you want to weigh in, it's great to weave them in. Uh, so uh, hopefully you're all doing well, hanging in there. Uh, state of, especially given the state of things, continued to uh, be a bit bleak at the moment, uh, but healthy and finding some time to get out for some adventure. Uh, so uh, what's shaking on this end? Uh, still trying to work through some of our own event shakeups. Uh, this past week, I had a chance to resubmit the revised COVID protocols for two of my races, the uh, Water Gap 25K and 50K, which we're still hoping to run September 12th. And then on that same day, uh, the Breakneck Point Trail runs half and full. Uh, really hoping to hear back on both of them uh, with confirmations, fingers crossed, uh, for this week. Uh, but as part of those, particularly Breakneck in terms of the mandates, just um, what it looks like this year. Uh, per the governor's office approval for our Cayuga Trails races, we had to nix our field down to New York State residents only, as well as a whole host of other modifications to the event. So I uh, spent a good chunk of time today uh, just cutting refund checks to Whiteface entrance and Breakneck Point entrance and looking over some of the water gap info. So for all of those, uh, stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have some answers here pretty shortly. Uh, on the gear or testing front, uh, let's see. So I'm um, here in the Finger Lakes Running Company uh, filming. Uh, while I'll stay fairly uh, focused on trail running gear for the Trails Collective, uh, here and there I'm still going to work in uh, some road-oriented product, uh, just because for most of us we still have road shoes in the lineup. Uh, and so what's on my feet um, this past week, I was putting in some opening miles into uh, the Brooks Hyperion Tempo. Uh, it uses a DNA flash foam midsole, uh, which I am finding I'm continuing to really like in some more runs in the Brooks Catamount Trail Shoe, which I reviewed a few weeks ago. Uh, we'll see only a couple miles or a couple runs in this, but I think I'm liking the uh, trail catter part, the, catter, the uh, uh, catamount a little bit better. Uh, and something really similar uh, in terms of heel to toe ratio, a uh, little bit greater stack height, uh, but really positioned similarly in their line, uh, which I just cracked open the box today, is the uh, Brooks Endorphin, or I mean, sorry, the Saucony Endorphin Speed. Uh, also using a pretty spongy midsole. Uh, this is using a TPU or a synthetic plate in here in place of carbon, uh, and I'm guessing it's going to feel pretty snappy and with a fairly aggressive toe spring. Uh, so even though, again, we'll stay focused on trail product, this is what I'm uh, looking at uh, at the moment. Uh, putting some opening miles into. Uh, also continuing to put uh, a couple more runs this past week into the Mad River TR from Saucony. For those of you who followed us out of the gates, you know that the TR1 this past year was one of my favorite uh, shoes of all time. Uh, much to my dismay and kind of what I was thinking was, I think I'm going to end up preferring the TR1 a little bit better. Uh, this one just feels like a bit more and not necessarily in the way that I want to feel it. But uh, it's still early, so we'll put some miles in. Still feels good under the feet. I just don't know it's as good as the TR1. Uh, also coming, uh, hopefully this week, uh, from a review from uh, teammate Aaron Stredney of the uh, Solomon Sense 4 Pro. Uh, for those of you who are already familiar with the Solomon line, you know where this stacks up. For those of you who aren't, uh, this is a pretty uh, slick, responsive uh, shoe from Solomon. Uh, has a four millimeter drop, has a really good ground feel. Uh, Solomon still uses some of the uh, stickiest or tackiest rubber out there, and it's a pretty nice package. Uh, I haven't run it myself, so I can't really weigh in, uh, but hopefully we'll get a good review from Aaron coming up. Also, let's see, also uh, put an uh, opening couple hours yesterday uh, into Ultimate Direction's Hydrolite Belt, uh, which is here. Uh, for those of you who also have been following along, know that I reviewed the Ultimate Direction Hydro Skin uh, or Hydro uh, Light Shorts as well as Skin Shorts and really loved them. Uh, I think they worked really well. Uh, the belt in the opening couple hours, not sure it's going to work quite as well as the um, shorts. I felt like when the bottles were full, I'm just getting 
a little bit too much of a saddlebag kind of slap. And it's a little bit tougher to really get the uh, thin draw cord in the front really cinched to make it comfortable. Uh, that was just the first run, so I'll put some more miles in it and do a more uh, lengthy review of it uh, pretty soon. Still a pretty slick product. I uh, just don't know if I'm going to like it as much of the shorts as the shorts. Uh, so what else is shaking? Uh, let's see. Uh, new patron supporters this week. Uh, those of you who have stepped forward to uh, make this whole project possible and get us out of the gates here, um, thank you. Uh, so this week, Tom Knowles. Uh, Tom's based in North Central Jersey in the, the part of New Jersey which most people don't know exists with beautiful hills, lakes, uh, and really rugged just terrain. We'll begin in the northernmost part of the state near the New York state line, which is essentially hippies and squirrel eaters. But outside of this forested region live the rich snobs who commute into New York City every day. Uh, he was a long time uh, roadie, switched over to trails I think in the end of 2018 and hasn't really looked back. I think raced seven times in 2019. Uh, in that mix included the really burly iron mines that I put on. He also ran a escarpment as well. Um, and so, Tom, uh, thank you so much for your support. And just one of his points of feedback was he just really appreciates these weekly uh, rundowns to try to stay abreast a bit of what's going on in our backyards. Uh, ben Drew uh, also came on. Uh, ben was the co-founder and owner of Run on Hudson Valley for the five or six years that it was open in Croton on Hudson, New York. Uh, he's also co-director uh, with me with the Breakneck Point Trail Runs, uh, as well as with the uh, Castle to River uh, Trail Races. Uh, a pretty awesome ambassador for the sport all around. Really nice dude. Uh, lives in New York, uh, splits his time a bit. Uh, but the past few years, he's created and really built up a site called The Wired Runner or wiredrunner.com. Uh, they've got a crap ton of best of uh, product uh, pitches and reviews on there. Uh, some of you, if you're just Googling best of whatever, you'll probably uh, come up with a wired runner. Uh, definitely check it out. Uh, Ben's been really tuned into uh, Run Specialty and the product for some time now, uh, as well as getting out there uh, and racing and putting in trail miles on his own. Uh, so check it out. Ben, thank you so much for your support. Uh, and then Corey West, who is on as one of our uh, first Patreon supporters, uh, upped his tier, stepping up into the, um, uh, well, you know, stepping right up. Uh, so Corey West, probably most or more known for his uh, professional bodybuilding uh, days or an occasional uh, waterfall uh, running photo wearing the classic retro John G. stripes uh, or maybe just being the most efficient UPS driver in the history of probably UPS as far as I know. Uh, he's been doing some classic runs in our region uh, for a bit now. Uh, he was a repeat offender for, might have been the uh, one of the inaugural Iroquois Trails 100s, if not a couple years or a few years at Virgil Crest. Uh, World's End, I think he's got a few finishes, Twisted Branch, uh, Eastern States, uh, several. So Corey West, thank you so much uh, for your support. Uh, so what's happened this past week uh, in terms of results? On the FKT front, which continues to just build steam, momentum, national and awareness, people getting out there, setting their own new routes, as well as uh, getting back out after ones that have already been set recently active. I uh, mentioned it uh, the end or just in the uh, show notes from last week, uh, but Steve Lang and Josh Reed set an AT uh, last, I think, Monday or Tuesday or something in there on Connecticut's uh, Appalachian Trail section. The, this guy and uh, actually these guys and this crew have uh, had a pretty phenomenal past, uh, well, kind of COVID time, getting out there some pretty uh, epic routes and terrain and are really just uh, pretty well fit at the moment. Uh, so nice work, guys. Um, one that's a multi-state effort. Uh, Susie Bosque, or Bosque, sorry if I'm going to mispronounce that, went big with a 10 hour, 33 minute effort linking the PA, Maryland, West Virginia, and Virginia sections of the Appalachian Trail, uh, calling it the four state challenge, shaving off 2.5 hours off the prior female supported mark from 2019. It's a burly effort, Susie. In Connecticut, Andrew Burford, 49 minutes, 25 seconds for the Zora Trail. Uh, Rafael Sarfati ran two hours, four minutes for the Bear Mountain 13 mile AT lollipop circuit. Stefan Rodriguez ran 48 minutes, 50 seconds on the 5.2 mile Ragged Mountain Loop, uh, shaving 30 seconds off his own mark from only a week ago. In New Hampshire, 
New Hampshire put up some burly efforts this week. Really impressive. Uh, Jordan Fields ran 527 on the 28.7 mile, 91 foot of gain, classic historic Pemi loop. That's totally flying. To date, the focus on the Pemi loop has really been on unsupported efforts. Seeing some of the best and most uh, technical trail runners really hit up that category of the Pemi loop year over year, taking that mark down. Pretty impressive. Uh, Jordan went out and after a baseline supported mark with this 527. Incredible, incredible to shave off 15 minutes off of Ben Thompson's amazing unsupported effort from June of this year. Jordan, nice work. And just a total Mac Daddy effort here. Uh, Will Peterson put in a 48, um, put in, um, basically set off to self-support cover uh, 48 of New Hampshire's 4,000 footers in an un well, unsupported fashion. Took him five days, 13 hours. Uh, the metrics are just wild. I checked out his Strava logs just to tally some of this up and what it came out to. Uh, day one, I'm just going to take you through it. Day one, 41 miles, 15,000 feet of elevation gain. Day two, 39 miles, 11,000 feet gain. Day three, 37 miles, 11,000 feet of gain. Day four, 37 miles, 11,000 feet of gain. Day five, uh, 38 miles, 12,500 feet of gain. Day five and a half for that last half day, 39 miles, 13,000 feet of gain. Tallying all that up, uh, 231 miles, 73,500 feet of elevation gain in 5.5 days. That's Jim Blanford crazy sick stuff right there. Uh, Will Peterson, that's phenomenal. Uh, great job, man. In New York, uh, Vade Gund, uh, who I just ran with yesterday, uh, shaved 16 minutes off the prior mark from June on the 22-mile Interlochen Trail in three hours, four minutes. Uh, Carson, time to get yourself back out there. Uh, Ted Arkilla and Michelle Zandona nabbing the baseline mixed-gender team mark of 223. Um, I forgot to tag what route that's on. In any case, nice work. I'll get back to that in the show notes. Uh, Mike Austin, 348 on the beautiful 27-kilometer Black Dome Wyndham High Peak Loop in the Catskills. He lowered the unsupported uh, male mark by 16 minutes. Having none of this time uh, from Mike Austin, though, Michelle Merlis headed out two days later to throw down a 342 for the unsupported female and new top mark for that route. Lauren Longfeld put in a burly 7 hours, 15 minute effort on the 23 mile Catskills Fire Tower Loop. Another where her new female self-supported effort becomes the fastest time of any gender for that route. And Chris Choi set out covering the classic routes of the 55 mile Devil's Path Long Path Escarpment Trail in an inaugural segment mark of 15 hours, 42 minutes. Uh, he ascended over 19,000 feet in the process. That's 19,000 feet and 55 miles. That, there's a ton of climbing as well. On PA, Randy Shemansky ran a 540 to establish baseline mark for the 30, 39 mile D&H Trail. In Virginia, Mark Dadeau and David uh, Majida uh, ran a 231 for the male unsupported one-way mark <clears throat> on the Bull Run Occoquan Trail, shaving 35 minutes off of Daniel Prince's time uh, from just in July. Uh, however, it should be noted that Daniel in that effort was also after and establishing the mark for the out and back, which he uh, took and established. In Vermont, John Burns got back, Josh Burns rather, Josh, sorry about that man, uh, got back out and after it, setting a baseline mark for the first running of the 27-mile Mount Mansfield Camel's Hump Challenge in 7 hours, 7 minutes. So all you FKTers, nice work out there. Event results. Uh, one that was outside of our uh, coverage region here, which, which had a few people from our region. Uh, two from PA uh, was the Bob's Big Timber Backyard Ultra in Ohio. Uh, ran this past weekend. Uh, just finished with Jacob Conrad. Uh, he was the last person standing with four, and this was the last person standing of, uh, event. Uh, he ran 41 laps or 41 hours for the win. Uh, and amongst our own, James Weaver was the eighth loser with 25 laps, a little over 100 miles in 25 hours. Awesome job, James from PA. And the other PA individual, the third loser on the day, an incredible, wicked, tough effort from Becky Kozak. She hung in there through 30 laps or over 120 miles in 30 hours. Pretty dang tough. Nice work, Becky. 
and we'll have more uh, hopefully close out tonight with a clip from her on that experience so uh, stay tuned in just a bit in the virtual running uh, point to point in brownsville vermont was an event that uh, moved to virtual this year they had a ride and run where an entrance could choose a course of their of their choosing and with funds or uh, raising funds to support the uh, food bank uh, up there no results in yet but you can find and if you want to uh, help raise funds for the uh, food bank in vermont uh, check them out at pointtopoint.org. <clears throat> Running as an in-person live event this past weekend it was the Dahlgren Heritage Rail Trun, uh, Trail Run uh, in King George, Virginia. It was a half marathon and 50K, and results haven't been posted yet. The Capitol Backyard Ultra, another last person standing event, uh, also a big uh, backyard qualifier. This ran in Potomac, Maryland. It was limited to 30 entrants this year. I think this is their inaugural year, but limited to 30 entrants. Uh, it seemed like it was a crusher with a heat index of over 105 degrees. Um, how that went down, uh, Aaron Ellison, I think, uh, took the win with, I believe, 27 loops, or what they call them, laps. And Sean McDermott and Trevor Bain uh, were in for the assist on that one. Jug End Loop Ultra and Egremont Mass, one we've mentioned a couple times here. It was a gone virtual event for this year. Uh, entrants had the month of July to hit the course in, Jug End, in the Jug End State Reservation for either 6-hour, 27-mile, or 4.2-mile events. And they submitted the info post-run. And so those results are in. And uh, who took the wins on this one uh, were the Bees. It's here for the Bees, claiming the top distance uh, at each. In the 6-hour, we had Bill Boyer, uh, or as he's called, B squared in South Egremont, Mass, putting in 33.68 miles. Uh, the second B in distance in the 27 mile event, Bill Odendahl, or BO, from running so damn fast in that uh, now technical rancid wear uh, in Trumbull, Connecticut in 520. And the third B taking the win in the 4.2 mile uh, distance was Benjamin Griffin. They some, I think they call him BG. Uh, for his affinity to break out in his own rendition of the Bee Gees staying alive uh, late in the race when everybody's fading. Uh, he's from Pittsfield, Mass., and took it in 34.50. Uh, nice work on the Bees and the Jug End uh, Loop um, trail runs. Turn into some of the media threads. Uh, two notable ones on the Mountain Peak Fitness. So for all of you who don't know, Mountain Peak Fitness is a training and coaching entity. Uh, they're based a bit um, northwest of New York City in the Hudson Valley pretty much tucked into uh, Harriman, but I believe they have clients all over. So uh, check it out. But two this week on their threads. One was uh, the first, and unfortunately not their first time out, just doing a trash pickup day. I guess one of the upsides to this COVID um, shakeup is uh, how many more people are out and active. Been a little bit tough for those of us who are used to some pretty quiet trail sections, which are now not so quiet. Uh, but one of the other tough parts is just the impact, which is really noticeable. Uh, not just parking areas and people getting out there, but just the amount of garbage uh, that I'm seeing and many of us are seeing uh, in just these areas. Uh, Mountain Peak Fitness, not their first time out, uh, but sent some time uh, out there with Jason Friedman as well picking up, um, I don't know, maybe, I think it was like eight or nine bags of garbage within maybe like a half mile of a dumpster and a trailhead. Uh, Mountain Peak Fitness, thanks for getting out there and doing your part. And to all those others, I know um, Trails Rock also put in some time out there collecting garbage just a couple weeks ago. It's unfortunate, but thanks for doing it. Uh, second one from their network this week. One of their clients got out, unfortunately, and had a injury incident with a boulder that just turned underneath his foot. Uh, much maybe less uh, intense, but a recollection as I'm mentioning it, thinking back to uh, Dave Mackey from a number of years ago. Uh, but in this one, they were tipped off. He's one of their coaching clients and one of the family members tuned in to say the, his Strava beacon was just pretty inactive or pretty static or on alert from uh, being static for a number of hours. Uh, they were able to track it uh, here, Elizabeth and, and um, Joe from Mountain Peak, uh, to be the bridge to the first responders in search and rescue. Uh, but they were on the scene uh, first and really uh, stabilizing, checking it out. Uh, the, unfortunately, the individual uh, Ray had, or um, 
not Ray, um, Jay rather, um, had a, I think, multi-point spiral fracture uh, in his ankle, as well as also taking a hit and damage or injury to his shoulder from the fall. Uh, but really kicks back to uh, their um, recommendation of all of us just taking precautions, letting people, friends, family, whatever, uh, know when we're, we're headed out, uh, having maybe a beacon on us, maybe carrying something like a Garmin uh, watch when they're not getting ransom uh to alert uh, individuals when there is something or incident detection. But they also, I'll just read through the quick tips from Mountain Peak Fitness. Uh, tell someone your intended itinerary. Uh, share your Strava beacon with a member of your family or a coach. Uh, carry a fully charged cell phone with a backup battery. Carry a paper map out there and know how to read it. Uh, download maps of the area and plug them in on your phone, whether using a Vonza or a Venza rather, uh, Trail Forks, All Trail, something like that. Uh, carry a small bag with you for your own uh, gear and emergency gear. Carry enough water and small filter, such as the Katahdin Be Free. Uh, be prepared for weather at the location you're visiting, not your home. Travel with someone if possible. Plan your route before you leave. And take a wilderness first aid course or at least get surf, uh, CPR first aid certified to assist with others that you may find. Uh, Jay did make it to the hospital. Uh, he was diagnosed uh, with that uh, spiral fracture, but uh, came out okay of a uh, intensive four hour surgery and uh, hopefully uh, is beginning the uh, mend process. On the Virginia Happy Trails uh, Facebook page, under the header of finding a runner who waits until 35 hours uh, to swear. Uh, this event was outside of our uh, coverage district, but worth mentioning. There was a uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court justice uh, pausing 35 miles into uh, a hundred mile effort to get sworn in to uh, the Supreme Court justice seat. Uh, and I'm just gonna play the, play the clip here. It's pretty cool. This wasn't a typical swearing-in ceremony. After running 35 miles, Karofsky in running shoes and all took the oath of office, marking the start of her 10-year term on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Karofsky won the April election against Justice Dan Kelly, bringing down the conservative majority. But Karofsky says she won't take any ideologies to the court, rather the ability to make clear decisions and a commitment to follow the law. Now we are able to continue to make sure that the voices of the people of Wisconsin are heard, that they know that they are gonna get a fair shake in their Supreme Court. What we ran on was winning back the Wisconsin people's seat on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And I could not possibly be more proud than I am today to be able to serve in that role. Today, Krosky was joined by former Governor Jim Doyle, fellow justices, her children, and a new puppy. With 65 miles to go after the ceremony, Krosky says she expects to wrap up her 100-mile race Sunday afternoon. And coming up on News 3 Now at 10, we'll share how she hopes to celebrate her success and what's next. So, uh, not to mix uh, trails collective and politics, but that's pretty sweet. Uh, from the East Coast Trail and Ultra Threads, uh, there's a useful public service announcement from a friend, uh, Ryan Thorpe. Uh, something that I wasn't aware of with all of you to check with your health insurance companies as they may offer a 20% uh, off or discount uh, for Garmin and Fitbits. Uh, so check that out. Uh, East Coast Trail Films in the queue. Uh, Christina Montemuro Photography and Video captured and presents a well done, uh, I think it's like 25 minutes or a short film following PA's Aaron Kleiman. as he put in a out and back effort on the Rachel Carson Trail in Western PA. I think it was maybe in May as COVID was setting in. Uh, wanting to do something uh, bold and burly for himself, uh, motivating and really uh, getting out there in this time of COVID. But a well done uh, short film. Uh, so to Christina and Aaron, nice work on that. And the Yeti film, Yeti film is now live. Uh, Yeti culture, for a trail community at its uh, core, for those of you not already familiar, uh, with events gone national, a couple in our region, uh, the damn Yeti 50s uh, weighing in, and both of these still on the board, scheduled for September, uh, the damn Yeti 50s with nearly 300 entrants, uh, scheduled for Damascus, Virginia, and a pushback date of September 12th, 
and a Western States qualifying Yeti 100 mile endurance run stacked with 362 entrants in Abington, Virginia, scheduled for September 25th. Uh, they'll also have significant COVID modifications coming. Uh, but what's got, what caught my eye is a was a pretty uh, well done film uh, from Jeff uh, Marrier. I reached out to Jeff. It's called the Dead Dead Yetiing Last, uh, and I'm going to let uh, Jeff preview the film uh, right here. So I've been doing trail running videos, race promos, all race recaps, all those sort of things for a while, and I'd gotten to a point where I really wanted to make a trail running documentary but I wanted it to be different than anything I'd seen. I wanted it to be something a little bit upside down from what was out there. And so here comes Jason Green and the Yeti Trail Runners, and you just don't get any more upside down than Jason Green. Here's a guy that gives, oftentimes gives the biggest prize to last place, the DFL. He uh, puts out fireball at the aid stations. There's just this irreverent yet fun attitude through the whole race. And so I made this movie, everything about running, like uh, what it's like to come in first, what it's like to come in last, what it's like to D uh, DNF and all those types of things. But it's all told through this off-center perspective of the Yeti trail runners and Jason Green. And, uh, it was just a really good time making it, and I really feel that I created something that was a little bit different, and also it's really relatable to me, because when I go running, Jason has this punk rock attitude and loves the Smiths and Minor Threat and that sort of thing. When I started running, I wasn't hearing Chariots of Fire in my head. I was hearing, uh, I was listening to Motorhead and the Beastie Boys, so it was something that not only did I find uh, entertaining and uh, interesting, it was something that I really found uh, relatable and I identified with. I am a Yeti trail runner, so this movie was made to not only honor those who are uh, part of the Yeti Trail Runners and represent their perspective, but it was also made to be a um, just a different, something fresh and interesting, for especially for 2020 when not many of us are running races and there's not much content out there to watch about races. And with that, uh, and thanks Jeff for, for following up there, I'm also going to segue in or weave in uh, the uh, trailer for that film so you guys get a taste of it here. Are uh, Yeti trail races irreverent? Yeah, yes. <laughs> what? Irreverent. Irreverent? <laughs> yeah, that's the fucking basis of it. <laughs> if you get lost today, it's your fault. He's a guy that doesn't give a sh and he's going to do what he wants to do. There's an article about someone running 50 miles in the woods. When I saw that article, I knew immediately this is what I was going for. This is fun. And if you get lost, guess what? You're lost. <laughs> we ultimately all are the black sheep here, right? And, and we all want that community family. We don't give a shit if you come in first or last. You know, like, it's all the same. Like, competition doesn't need to be put in everything. These guys are the and for all of those wanting to catch the full film, uh, for sure do so. It's great to support runners in the community, uh, those who are making great films. Uh, so check it out, patreon.com forward slash trail running zen, or just look for the uh, Yeti, uh, Yeti movie and you could probably uh, find it. We'll also have the link in the show notes here. Uh, six bucks to make a donation, not a donation, but uh, to really compensate uh, Jeff for this really wonderful work. So check it out, share it with your friends. Uh, nice film, nice work, Jeff. Uh, so gonna uh, have Ellie segue in, take us through uh, a little bit of rundown on uh, what played out in this week's uh, trail and podcast world. Uh, Ellie, take it. Hey, Trails Collective, Ellie here, and it's time for your media of the week. We're gonna start with the gang at Cultra. They talked with Cindy Sullivan. When Cindy was in middle school, she was forbidden to run because she had a degenerative genetic knee condition, which got her out of gym class and all physical activity. About 20 years later, Cindy decides she's going to start to run to um, inspire her three-year-old son. And then she caught the rug and she's been, after running her first trail race, and she's been going at it ever since. 
She graduated to the ultra distance and has since gone on to run 50 milers, 100 Ks, 100 milers, and even multi-day events. That's pretty awesome. Jay and Phil are back in the pain cave this week to discuss an actual race. Phil breaks down his race at Bull State, a 500 kilometer race across Tennessee. After listening to him, the race sounded terrible. But then a few days later, Jay and Phil brought the winner, Francesca Muccini, in, in to, to explain the best way to run the race and most importantly, how to enjoy it. So Phil's kind of a drama queen. In the Trails Collective Media this week, I put out an episode with Jeff Adams discussing his recent 175 mile virtual race with the second quarantine backyard ultra. We also discussed his uh, FKT last September on the long path in upstate New York. This week, I interviewed two Rochester runners, Sophie Kotak and Katie Gadu. Sophie took us through, the tr uh, through Hugo Trails, running barefoot and being a PhD student in R at RIT in mathematics. Katie and I discussed running in college at Notre Dame with Molly Huddle, coming back to running after taking a break, getting into trails, and finishing third at Twisted Branch. Look for those coming in the next couple weeks. That's all for me this week. Back to you, Ian. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, so let's see what happened in, what's happening coming up, uh, I guess, this week or the next couple weeks uh, in terms of events. Uh, one we plugged uh, this week, or last week rather, uh, the Beast of Burden Summer Ultra in Lockport, New York. Uh, it moved to virtual this year called the Gimme Shelter 2020 Beast of Burden Ultra Marathon. Uh, entrants can do 25, 50, 100 miles uh, under their uh, cutoff to get the swag. Check it out at ultrasignup.com. Uh, for the Beast and Burden Summer one. I believe it's still open to registrations. Uh, one that we plugged the past couple weeks, coming up uh, this week, August 6th, is the Luna Run in South Berwick, Maine. A 3K, 5K, 10K. Uh, they are virtual this year. A ladies event looks really wonderful in terms of just uh, support, really just support, motivation, inspiration. Uh, check it out, the Luna Run. We did reach out, and hopefully they'll be able to send us a video clip in the next uh, week or two, uh, giving us a snapshot of how the Luna Run goes. Uh, but you can check it up at runsignup.com, just in case registration is still open for the Luna Run. Husky Ruck Memorial 10K in New Gloucester, Maine, also running, I think maybe the 6th as well. Uh, and August 7th, uh, on the Bacon Trail, the Nailer, uh, Nailer Mill Trail 7K. Uh, it says, uh, again, as I mentioned last week, easily the toughest race in the Delmarva uh, Peninsula uh, down in Maryland, I believe. Uh, pretty sweet looking event. Um, and um, I believe this is the one where uh, all entrants are going to get a pretty sweet, uh, maybe bacon oriented mask. Uh, yeah, bacon and scrapple mask going to all entrants. Uh, this, uh, I don't, let's see, registration, ah, registration closed on August 1st. Uh, but check it out for next year on the Bacon Trail, and hopefully we'll hear a bit about uh, how that shakes out uh, post-race as well. Uh, the Ragged 75 stage race was starting this week. Uh, this weekend, August 8th, Moosamaloo Ultra in Goshen, Vermont. I think still running. Last time I checked, registration, though, did close out. Uh, Mighty Mosquito 99-mile trail run. At least the individual portion is still happening in Hanoi, Hanoi Falls, New York. Uh, check it out for the Mighty Mosquito. I'm not sure if you could potentially register uh, last minute, uh, but if not, um, well, you could always beg and try to get yourself in there. All right, uh, let's see. Also looking ahead, one that um, just caught my eye that I didn't know that it was going to run this year, but for sure an absolutely uh, beautiful course is the Green Lakes Endurance Runs outside of Syracuse, New York. Uh, the namesake Green Lakes, really deep opal blue green water wicked clear really just a uh, pretty park uh, entrance looks like way down uh, this year but i think they're still running uh, beautiful 50k and 100k really um, easily uh, accessible course uh, despite level you can go out there and you can hammer it for a really fast time or a really good one for beginners as well in terms of just aid location as well as no big climbs and really just gently rolling so uh, check it out uh, that I think is scheduled for September, uh, and we'll weigh back in there as well. So for all of you tuning in, thanks so much. Uh, still things to come. Uh, we are starting uh, with a new e-commerce platform, uh, hopefully in this next week or so, uh, which is really going to increase the depth of the Trails Collective store, 
Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. We'll have access to not just what we have in shop, but to the vendors direct through a uh, pairing with their a company called Fitted. So I'm really looking forward to that. It should make for a really uh, slick and deep store uh, coming your way. Uh, also, starting with a uh, marketing company who's going to uh, help uh, launch us get some of the Trails Collective out, which I've yet to do. I've mentioned it a, a couple times, where uh, those of you who have just found this through some of the Facebook plugs, through your own communities, I'm stoked that you're here and found us, and I'm grateful for anything you can do now to share this with your own communities. Uh, but with that said, I haven't even put it out to my own mailing list yet. We've been generating a lot of great content. I'm thankful to the support so far. Uh, but we're about to launch it more fully here coming soon. Uh, life's been a little bit busy, uh, so I'm getting to it all I can. Uh, but share with your communities, help get, us, uh, get it out there more, and thanks for being with us this week. Uh, so taking us out tonight is going to be a clip from Stud Awesome Wicked Tough from uh, Idiot Runner Gear out of PA, uh, Becky Kozak. Nice work this weekend, and take it out tonight. See ya! Over the weekend, I ran a last man standing event, Bob's Big Timber Backyard Ultra in Ohio. It was my first time doing an event like this. It's a four mile loop that you run every hour on the hour. It comes with different strategies. People, some ran it really fast, came in in 42 minutes and had, you know, 18 minutes to eat, rest, um, prepare to go to the next lap. Some would use up a lot of the time and not stiffen up and just head back out. You could walk a lot then. I was pretty consistently about 50 minutes. I ended up being the fourth overall, last girl, and uh, I did 30 hours, 125-ish miles. The first 100 miles was pretty fun. I started out with about 60-some people in the day loop, which we ran till 8.30 that night. So for 14 hours was the day loop. And it was a lot of single track, up and down rollers in the woods. Um, at the beginning, it was a little harder because, you know, everybody's going pretty slow. So you're stuck behind groups of people. So that was frustrating at times, even though it was good for me, I'm sure, to be to walk even though I didn't really feel like it or to go slower it would help me in the long run I'm sure you know um, people started dropping out you know probably around 20 miles those that were just getting in a long run or just do out there to participate and do a couple loops but you would see most drop at the at significant points like the th like 50k and 50 miles in the 100k and then you know you saw a big drop at 100 miles so at 8 30 p.m. we switched to the night loop and the night loop was uh, part dirt road and part like mowed grassy loop and that was pretty flat on the grassy part but same thing you have to kind of figure out your own strategy of where you want to walk, where is best to run, how to how to use the clock. Um, I was crewed by my husband Eric Kosek and he did an outstanding job. We would talk about what I wanted for the next time or you know and to prepare for when I wanted to change shoes. I changed shoes and clothes between the day loop and the night loop and everything held up pretty well. I ended up with a couple blisters but for the most part my body held up well it's it's the mind that's the killer when it um after 100 miles that's when eric said the race was really going to start and it was very true i had you know a little bit of down period in the night time when i started getting tired and i felt like i was getting slow but overall like i didn't it wasn't an issue and then i hit 100 miles and we went back to the day loop at 6.30 a.m. And I started struggling for sure. Probably 108 miles, 112 miles-ish. I had a really low spot. I, I'm sure I was grumpy and I, I didn't want to go back out. I was still beating the clock, like, easily. And, you know, 
Eric's pushing me to go out, and he did a great job. I went out for a longer than I would have if he wasn't there. I I found that I was I would have a good loop and then a not good loop. And during the good loop, I could talk myself into, okay, this isn't so bad, you know. I can go for another loop, and then the bad, I just did not want to continue. When it came down to it, at, when I finally gave in it at 30 hours, there was just no talking me out of it. I was still beating the clock. I just decided that was it. I was, this was good enough. If I were to do another one, or I should say when I do another one, I think my whole goal will be, to, if I beat the clock, I keep going. Um, my goal this time was not to give up, and, you know, mm -hmm. sure, I would have liked to win, but I think I wasn't really prepared for what was coming after 100 miles. I, my mind definitely won and that's what caused me to give up. It was a it was a fun event. I think the the I'm definitely stiff this morning and tired, but probably my worst injury is from the timing cuff that you have to wear on your ankle. I should have worn long socks. I have it's all chafed and sore. But besides that, like my body held up really well. I feel like I was pretty well trained and I look forward to doing another one.